From Heterodox Academy, this is Half Hour of Heterodoxy. Conversations with scholars and authors, ideas from diverse viewpoints and perspectives. Here's your host, Chris Martin. Welcome to episode number 50. This is a landmark episode for us because it's number 50, and we've had 150,000 downloads of episodes since we launched the podcast. So if you're a listener, thank you for listening. If you've just subscribed, feel free to check out our older episodes. And to those of you who've shared the podcast with other people, we really appreciate that. My guest today is Katie Gordon. She's a licensed clinical psychologist, and she is a former associate professor at the North Dakota State University Department of Psychology. She's also the co-host of the Jedi Council podcast. I'll be talking to her today about trauma and specifically whether offensive political speech does or doesn't cause trauma. Hi, Katie. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on, Chris. So we're here to talk about trauma and political expression. But before we get to that, let's talk about the definition of trauma. How do psychologists and psychiatrists define trauma now? So what I'd like to read from is the way that clinical psychologists typically define trauma, which is through the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the fifth edition right now. And according to the DSM-5, a trauma, at least if you're looking at the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, has to be exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. And those four different ways are directly experiencing the traumatic event, or witnessing in person the event as it occurred to others, learning that the traumatic event occurred to a close family member or close friend, or experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to aversive details of the traumatic events. For example, first responders who collect human remains, police officers repeatedly exposed to details of child abuse. So those are the ways that within The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we define trauma. And are there any other definitions out there? There are other definitions out there that other fields use that I'm not as as familiar with, but I, I know someone about, for example, there's some discussion of historical trauma or the idea of trauma that can be passed on through generations. But when we're talking about post traumatic stress disorder, what I just described is typically the definition that's used. It did change from the last version of DSM 4. And specifically what they did, which was I thought was interesting, is that it used to include emotional responses as part of it. So in the last version of the DSM, they required that you reacted with helplessness and fear, and they actually wanted to have some more conceptual clarity and focus on the events that one had to be exposed to in this version of it. So by adding focus, they narrowed the chances that someone would be diagnosed with trauma. Is that correct? Well, it. It, it's kind of, I could narrow and broaden depending on what it was. What was happening is they were missing some people who experienced a traumatic event, for example, in combat, but they didn't respond with the type of fear that was required to fear. So they were missing some people and maybe catching some people that otherwise wouldn't have qualified. So when it comes to perceived discrimination as a cause of trauma, what do we know? In terms of specifically with trauma, so typically perceived discrimination is a broad term that can include many different types of discrimination. It can include day-to-day incidents, things that people say directly to you or about groups that you belong to, but it can also include things like not having access to housing or not getting a job or being fired because of something having to do with who you are. And so what we know in terms of trauma is that's less that's been studied less precisely but there is a large body of literature finding that perceived discrimination is connected to worse mental health outcomes including things like anxiety and depression and that it can serve as a stressor and activate a stress response in in terms of blood pressure and cardiovascular activity. And so that's distinct from trauma, but it would still be considered a stressful event that can have a negative impact on mental health. So when we talk about the term perceived discrimination, we do add perceived as psychologists because we want to emphasize that it's from the perception. It's from the eyes of the 
person experiencing it and it's not an objective rater looking at it. Um, are there any studies out there that you know of that also look at it from an objective rater point of view? One of the, the things that makes it really difficult to study discrimination, as you know, is that there are things that might happen just between two people that someone might not know about. And so asking about what that happens, sometimes you can get um, quote unquote more objective if you are more specific about what the person said, you know, did they specifically refer to your race or your sexual orientation. And as we know, that doesn't always happen. So there are those types of studies. And then there are other types of studies that might look at things like um, disparate uh, physical health outcomes. And at least some of the disparity that's been found, for example, between black and white women when it comes to childbirth, where black women are more likely to have complications and um, more likely to have infant infant mortality outcomes. Some of that has been linked. There's actually been some study on perceived discrimination, but some of it has also tried to look at potential structural factors that could contribute to that. Okay. So when it comes to political speeches on campus, the most salient issue, I think, for most of us is race. And I think maybe since around 2012, a lot of professors, either in their newspapers or uh, by newspapers, I mean campus newspapers or some other source, have probably heard one or two students complaining about the fact that an extremely political, politically offensive opinion could cause trauma. And scientifically, what do we know about that claim? Okay, so according to the definition of trauma that I just gave, unless there's a violent event that occurs, which sometimes does happen on, on at these um, at at these speeches, but Often does not. Like a Charlottesville. Yes, exactly. Or or even um, Richard Spencer appearing at Michigan State University of Florida. I believe there was some violence that occurred while on site there, or people threatened with violence. And so in those cases, those would fit under the potentially under the umbrella of trauma. Most people don't develop post-traumatic stress disorder even when they face trauma, but it's possible, depending on a lot of individual factors and also what happened. In terms of attending a speech where there's not violence or threatened violence to someone, it doesn't fit under the strict definition of trauma. I think that it can certainly cause stress. And I and I think that it's important to acknowledge that I think what a lot of people are concerned about maybe is is sometimes called trauma. Maybe that gets people to listen because we know that trauma is a bad thing and it means I'm really worried about this and that kind of amplifies the message. But what a lot of students, at least in talking to them or that have expressed and kind of listening to what they've said, is that they're not particularly worried about trauma in terms of PTSD, like I just talked about. But what they're worried about is that having these t- types of extremists es- espouse their views can actually perpetuate the hateful beliefs about entire groups of people and that that might perpetuate social inequities and, and that that's what they're really concerned about. So you're saying that when you have one-on-one conversations, it's pretty clear that students know what the definition of PTSD is? No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't say that. I would say I was speaking more to how they describe their reasons for being opposed to these speakers on campus. And of course, that's just going to be a sample of people I've read about or talked to. I don't think I think that there are a lot of psychological terms that people, students and a lot of people misuse. People will say they're depressed. They don't mean clinical depression, or they'll say they're so OCD. They don't mean they have OCD. So I do think that there's also a difference between people in fields using very precise terms versus kind of the general public using terms. And so when they say trauma, they might mean it's stressing me out, or they might mean that they think it's going to cause actual trauma. I think there's kind of a range depending on who's saying that. So in terms of extreme stress... Uh, from the, from a campus administrator's point of view, is there any reason to suggest that an event on campus shouldn't occur if no one is compelled to attend it? I think that's a great question, and some of it is outside of what I'll comment on the mental health aspects of it. So I think that there's a very strong case to be made legally for free speech rights in public spaces. And I think when people make those arguments, that's That's a very honest assessment of what's necessary to be there. However, sometimes mental health gets thrown in either to say that it's good for people's mental health to 
to be exposed to these kinds of stressors. I don't know of any data that suggests that. Um, or people will say that, you know, you're claiming that there's some stressful or mental health thing associated with this, but what you're really trying to do is just suppress free speech and censor people. And I don't, I don't think that either of those are true. Of course, there's a wide range of things going on there. And so I think if you're going to take a look at why you're doing something, there's a strong argument to be made from a free speech aspect, but from a mental health benefit aspect, I I don't see a strong of an argument there. I don't see any strong argument there, to be honest with you. And I also think it's reasonable to consider whether some people might be negatively impacted by it, whether they'll feel that the university is not sticking to the inclusiveness of their mission, whether the university is sticking to the education of their mission. These are difficult questions, especially if you're a big proponent of free speech, as I am. But I think that sometimes mental health gets thrown in there into the mix, and it's not exactly being used the correct way or in the ideal way in these discussions. I mean, my own reading of the literature on adversity and growth is is that it's really complicated and there are lots of indiv- individual differences. So um, people who've had a couple of major life adversities, I think, are generally happier in terms of well-being and less depression than people who've experienced zero. So there's some growth that occurs, and most people do experience something like a death in the family. So everyone experiences that form of adversity. Um, but when it comes to growth, I think there's just this variability, and it's hard to predict what any individual will do. Yeah, I I think that's absolutely right. I agree with you. I also think that there are a lot of ways to grow on campus and kind of back what we were talking about, would that be considered an adversity if there's a political extremist speaking on campus such that there would be growth from it? I'm maybe I'm a little I'm a little doubtful of that. If we take that to the full argument, which I do think people are really concerned about, which is people being completely sheltered from opposing views, that should be a concern of any university. And that's totally worth considering from an educational mission standpoint. I just think it's not as clear of a relationship with the mental health part. Hmm. And what about events that students are compelled to attend or at least required to attend for class credit or something? Is that a more of a sensitive issue from a mental health perspective? You know, I think that it, in short, yes, but I think it depends a lot on who the speaker is. I mean, if we're talking about someone like Milo, which I can't imagine someone making it a requirement to attend, um, there, if someone has particular vulnerabilities, then it it may not be fair to require them to go. But if it's someone who is is not like that, it's a someone an academic with expertise in an area, and you might disagree with them. I really don't see any problem with that. I think the hard part is defining where that goes. And the best discussions I've seen this actually happen is between students and faculty on campus. I think there are a lot of differences there, and if students and faculty talk to each other then I think that can be really productive because, for example, I taught abnormal psychology for 10 years. And in that class, we cover suicide, homicide, sexual assault. We cover all kinds of topics. I've almost never had anyone, actually, I've never had anyone complain about anything being too much for them, um, with the exception of one person getting squeamish at a video I showed that involved some blood. But there were not, but not related to the content. I have had one or two people say, you know, I lost someone to suicide or I was sexually assaulted and I prefer to um, not come to class. Most of the time I'll talk to them about how it's good to have the information and, and can we work out a way for them to come to class. But if it's someone who's already experienced this hardship and they're vulnerable, I don't think that having to sit through a class while they're thinking about their cousin that just died by suicide is necessarily going to help them at that point. So that's why I think that dialogue is really important. And when it comes to the research on the stress that's caused, so there's clearly some stress caused, Mm -hmm. um, do we have any estimates on the effect sizes? Like, is it a substantial amount of stress that endures or is it ephemeral stress? So my usual cautions about interpreting any research. In short, yes, there are these large meta-analyses looking at effects of racism on mental health. They tend to be correlations of 0.2, and that's pretty robust across studies. And as as we know in psychology, 
there are a lots of different factors that contribute somewhat usually that come together. And so that means for a lot of people, they'll be relatively unaffected. For other people, they'll be more affected. And some of it will depend on the nature of the event that occurred. One of the things that makes the literature a little difficult to interpret, because I was trying to look specifically at people who heard things said about groups they belong to versus had something said directly to them. A lot of these combine all of those together. And so I think it's something that there needs to be more research that's more precise. But overall, what you do see is a pattern that increases risk for anxiety or depression for people who have experienced racism. And clearly, for some people, they're going to have vulnerability factors that would amplify that. And then for other people, what they consistently find in these studies, too, is that social support can act as a buffer to these stressors, that people are less likely to develop mental health issues when exposed to racism if they have good social support. And in terms of a speaker like Richard Spencer, I think most people would say unequivocally that he's racist. So in a situation like that, do you think there's a difference between a campus where people perceive that others are mostly supportive and this is just one random event versus it's sort of like the final nail in the coffin and you've already experienced lots of situational racism and then this is one more event? Do you think there's a, a difference there, a categorical difference where it's in the second case it's it's more, more concern? Absolutely. In, in talking to various people who, um, students and faculty, it seems like if you overall feel supported at your institution in a number of ways, then you, including if you see people trying to protest Spencer, for example, coming to campus, then you can still feel like you belong there overall. If you're already experiencing events, and then on top of that, this is happening, I, th I think that changes the context. And that's part of what makes this quite complicated, right? There's not really a one size fits all here. And so yeah, I, I do think it, it makes a difference for the individual, but also the particular context of the campus, the city, those types of things. So in terms of concrete suggestions for, for actual policies that administrators can consistently implement in order to be fair to everyone, what sort of suggestions do you have there? Sure. So one thing that I, I wanted to say is that I'm always a little cautious about recommendations for administrators, because I think sometimes things can be best worked out with students and faculty and involving administrators, but they're talking to each other. But I sometimes the top down approach, I worry that sometimes that doesn't work out as well. Sometimes administrators, well, they have different concerns about things related to the university maybe than students and faculty might have. So working together, I think, is a good idea. Okay, so my suggestions, one is that that any kind of plans are individually tailored to the university, their particular setting that involves a respectful dialogue with students and faculty rather than administrators solely leading it. I think that it's really important to include mental health experts in these discussions. Most campuses have counseling centers and they have experts on college mental health right right there on campus. And if you consult with them, they have a pretty good idea about how to navigate these types of situations because they've been working on campus for so long and directly with students. And they also stay in touch with kind of national information on campuses. The second thing is that I mentioned that research shows that social support matters. And so expressing support for students can be helpful. That doesn't mean that you 100% do what students ask. They, You might disagree with what they're asking. And I, and I think that's fair for a number of different reasons. But showing that you support them for who they are and you care about their learning can be a powerful experience for students. What doesn't help is deriding them by acting as though they're weak or that they're unable to handle simple difference of opinion. That may be true in some cases, but in a lot of cases, these are students who are really concerned about bigotry and concerned about various social inequality. And that's why they're really concerned, for example, about Spencer being invited to their campus. And then I would say on top of that, number three, be precise in your rationale, which I was kind of talking about before, if the speakers do come to campus. There is an idea in motivational kind of frameworks that if you if someone must do something, for example, 
um, when Spencer tried to go to Michigan State University, they declined, but they went into court mediation, and then they're required to have him on campus. But if you if you give the rationale for saying, you know, we're doing this for free speech reasons, for, for legal reasons, then I think that can be helpful to be precise in that language, rather than some of the language that suggests that, and this will be good for your mental health for some reason, or this will benefit you for some reason, because it may not, and there's evidence that won't both personal, both in terms of racism being connected to mental health problems and other to- types of bigotry as well. But in addition to that, a lot of these students are are concerned. I think about historically how propaganda has helped to spread ideas, and it's not just about the hour long speech they have. So I think showing that support for students can be helpful. I think it's it's really important to not equate mental health issues with weakness or living a sheltered life from dissenting opinions. There's an increase in in mental health problems. And I believe that there are people out there who care a lot about resilience and strength. And sometimes what I've seen happen in experiences and working my own university is that if faculty give out mental health resources or send them around or something like that, that it's sometimes viewed as this is going to plant the idea in someone's head that they have a mental health problem. And that doesn't really map on with the data that we have. What suggests is that a lot of people don't seek help when they need it. And what we also tend to see is that most people, for example, there's pretty rigorous research looking at if you ask people about suicide, does it make them suicidal? No, it does not. And so I think that applies here. In addition, I think there's a misunderstanding about what counseling is by some people that they think of it as hand holding or they think of it as some kind of just re, you know unconditional reassurance when really it's actually about teaching skills for coping with life facing difficulties head on which is very consistent with what a lot of people express concerns about I think when they're doing this jumping back to one thing you said you said that talking about uh, mental health resources in class is beneficial um, I mean, I believe it is, but I wasn't actually aware that people had collected data on this. So what do the data show? Oh, I'm sorry. I I, I may have um, combined some of the things I was saying. There's not evidence specifically that I'm aware of that showing it in the classroom is beneficial, but there's not evidence to my knowledge that it's harmful. The ideal situation would be that we could figure out who needs the resources and just get them to those people. But unfortunately, we aren't able to do that. And so I think just presenting it in your class, what's going to happen is most people will who don't need it will ignore it. Many people who might need it will ignore it. And those who do need it will take it up. And anecdotally, I have to say over 10 years, I have had students tell me or tell me later on, thanks for putting up the resources. And it wasn't a big specific thing, but I talk about mental health stuff and I'd include it just like you would include information about there are flu shots on campus, right? And that kind of opens the opportunity to students so that they know there are resources available to take care of their health. Right. And do we know why some students don't seek help? A lot of it has to do with ideas about them needing to fix it themselves. It's that their shame and if they just do something differently, then they'll be able to recover. And they're embarrassed because it is on, especially you know, sometimes they don't want to go on their parents' insurance because their parents would find out. And if they go on campus, their peers might see them. Right. In my class, it's pretty natural to bring it up because I would I teach about mental health stuff. So, but I think in other classes too, as you're talking about on-campus resources, that's that's another way to just inform students. They learn about it in orientation, but they learn a lot on orientation. It doesn't, I doubt it hurts to bring it up again. Yeah, I mean, one reason I asked is that I know the um, the degree of stigma around mental health, um, around seeking treatment for mental health, has been going down consistently for several decades. Yeah, and I I think that's fantastic, and I and I am surprised by I can see that in how students talk to each other, but there are still some people, and some of it I think is also relevant to if you're depressed, you tend to, you tend to blame yourself. And so it might have to do with that too. So I agree. I think there's been a lot of progress on that aspect of it. And yet there are still sometimes barriers for people. So getting back to suggestions, were there any others? Uh, I guess one more thing I just wanted to add about that is that, you know, everyone, once they do seek mental health treatment is screened. And if they come in and say, I, I was traumatized 
because of this event. The first thing a mental health practitioner does is evaluate based on the diagnostic criteria, whether that's what happened or if it's something else. And the person will get feedback on that, which I think can be very useful. So in other words, there are a couple checks and balances in, in place there. Um, let's see. The The other thing I wanted to say, I think most faculty do this already, but just valuing students' expression of speech. Sometimes students are not going to go about things the same way that faculty might or other people might. And there are some times that it might seem like what they're doing isn't effective. But I tend to think that a lot of students are putting in time and resources to do what they think is important for social causes rather than trying to simply avoid discomfort. And I think that a lot of faculty know that. And I, I think being explicitly supportive of that or or going into this situation, trying to see the good there until told otherwise can be helpful for students to know that you care about them and you take them seriously, even if you don't ultimately agree with them. Right. I mean, I think one source of concern for faculty was the Charles Murray incident at Middlebury, where a faculty member invited him and the faculty member was injured and possibly she's suffering from trauma. I don't think she is. I've heard interviews with her and she hasn't mentioned that, but she was attacked. So I think some faculty members are concerned about those kinds of situations. Oh, yeah. And I certainly am concerned about those kinds of situations, too. I think that any violence that happens on campus in, in reaction to that of course, people have different opinions. I'm I'm opposed to that. And I think that those incidents, I think there's probably, depending on how common they are, even if it's not the common thing, which I don't, I don't think it, it is, it is worth knowing about, but it's also worth keeping in context the, the probability of that being the outcome versus what I think a lot of other incidents tend to, the way they tend to go is that there's some organized protest the speaker still goes on and there aren't injuries involved. We should be cautious about those things, just like a lot of students are not going um, to experience a trauma or be physically threatened there. But, you know, safety, I know, is of concern. And so I think we want to think about those things, but we also want to make sure that it doesn't change our perspective of the overall picture of what's happening, I guess. And I think if you tell students you value what matters to them, it gives you actually an opportunity to talk with them about what might be effective or, I mean, it's not from an educational standpoint as much as within your boundaries, or at least talk to them about what their concerns are. And so, again, it's it's about kind of having a respectful dialogue, not necessarily agreeing or endorsing with what they're, with certain types of approaches. Right. I mean, I think there's a minority effect too, where a minority of students, a very small minority of students can start a violent attack and then faculty members can be scared and overestimate the number of students who would actually do something violent. Yeah, I think I think that happens a lot, right? We're we're supposed to we're kind of evolved to pay attention to to threat and and protect against that. And so I can see even if I say, you know, looking back here are the statistics, I might still have a gut feeling of fear of that happening and wanting to prevent it. And I think that's important to pay attention to. So uh, to wrap up, do you want to say a few words about your podcast? Sure. Thanks for asking. So my, as a clinical psychologist, I'm very interested in discussing mental health in ways that are accessible to the public so that people understand what we mean by certain terms, including trauma and other types of things. And also so people understand what types of treatments are scientifically supported for mental health problems. So the way that we've done that, uh, my co-host is Brandon Saxton, and the way we've done that with our podcast is that we typically take fictional characters from ranging from Batman to the TV show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend to all kinds of things and discuss mental health elements. And we take it seriously and talk about it, and we have fun too, but we talk about it through the DSM-5 lens, and we also talk about it through what we know scientifically about mental health. And so that's that's the premise of our podcast. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that, and thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate this conversation. You can follow Katie on Twitter at Dr. Catherine Gordon. Catherine is with a K. It's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N. You can find a link to that in the show notes and also a link to our podcast. Our next episode will be a recording of a lecture and discussion from New York City 
at the American Enterprise Institute. Arthur Brooks and Deb Mashek will be talking about Arthur's latest book, Love Your Enemies. That event is happening on March 13th, so some of you may have attended it in person. We will be releasing the full recording as an episode as well. Thank you for listening. It's an honor to be at episode 50. If you like the podcast, please visit iTunes and leave us a review. And if you'd like to contact me, you can reach me at podcast at heterodoxacademy.org or on Twitter at chrismartin76. Thank you.